Father, thank you for your word. And we've learned so much through the book of Judges, so much prophecy, so much uh, about how the current state of our society so mirrors where Israel was back then, God. And we thank you for your word. May this last chapter be the um, proverbial icing on the cake that seals in our hearts and minds that was a, a good season. And may we remember this book and remember the things that you've taught us and may we live it out. You changed my life through it, God, and I pray that you've changed other lives through it. And bless us, Holy Spirit, have your way in our hearts. May we open them fully to you. May we, we not push away anything you want to do. If there's a word of prophecy tonight going forth to any heart, if there's a word of encouragement, if there's a rhema word, whatever it is, Father, I'm ready. I'm ready. Take a, a coal from the altar. Touch, touch my lips with that burning fire. And may my words be few and may your words be many. These things for the furtherance of the kingdom of our God. Amen. Amen. If I had an iPhone up here, I'd say, this is an iPhone. And there's a very specific way to use this iPhone so that it, you get the optimal out of it. And I'd tell you to read the tutorial, and I'd tell you to go through the apps and all that stuff. Now, if you're one of those people who gets, like, a VCR that has every feature in the world, but yet when I go to your house, it's blinking 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock. It can do everything, man. The VCR, you bought a, it's a VCR. There's no VCRs anymore, is there? <laughs> there you go. Blu-ray player. Is that the newest thing now? The Blu-ray player. And it can, like, turn your lights off and on in the house, but you, you're still playing DVDs in it, you know? This is the state of the nation of Israel. They've got the promises of God. They've got the scrolls of Moses. But you know what they're getting out of it? Superstition. They're getting out of it superstition. What you're going to see tonight is so sad on so many levels that by the end of it, you're like, no way they did that. Yes. They found themselves... Imagine coming to church every week, wondering, looking at the cross, everyone going, why aren't you blessing me? And then you're out there, and you're huffing and you're puffing, you're sexing and you're texting, and you're doing all these crazy things out there, but every week you come back and go, what? What am I doing? And it's like, are you not listening? Are you not reading? Are you not spending any time? Is your heart not convicted at all? Now, I know that's nobody here. Believe me, I know. With these thoughts in mind of superstition and religion, let's look at the depths that the nation of Israel has finally sunk. Now, the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mitzpah, saying, none of us shall give his daughters to Benjamin as a wife. Please give me your attention. If you've not been here for the last month or so, there was a nation of Benjamites, a town, a whole city, 26,000 of them. And they had so let their nation, their cities, go bad that a man taking his wife through there lodging at an old man's house. They surround his house at night. They bang on the door. Where is that man spending the night at your house? Bring him out here. We want to have sex with him. This man, not, in the, <laughs> not the most courageous man either, says, like, you know what? Here, have my wife instead. They so defile this woman that she dies. He wakes up in the morning, literally kicks her. Get up, we're leaving, to find she's dead. I told you if you've not been here, the book was weird, right? He picks her up, he throws her on his donkey, he rides to his hometown, and he cuts her up into 12 pieces and sends her to all the nations, all the cities of Israel, each one. The nation of Israel is outraged. They call a grand meeting and they say, Benjamin must pay. So they declare war. And they wipe out after a couple of battles that are very interesting, as we looked at last week, two weeks ago, all but 600 of the men 
They burnt the city with fire. They killed the women and children. And here they make a vow saying, none of us shall give our daughters to Benjamin as a wife. Don't say I can Can't say I blame them. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah had nothing on what was going on in Mitzvah at the time. Then the people came to the house of God and remained there before God till evening. They lifted up their voices and wept bitterly and said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel? Huh? All of a sudden now you're wondering why you've destroyed the whole city? I don't know where it comes in, where God told them to stop, whether God wanted the whole tribe of Benjamin, if he had reserved some. But all of a sudden, they're feeling bad about what they've done. And they went to the house of God, and why did... And of course, like, isn't it so true? Why did you let this happen? Why did I let this happen? I'm not the one that told you to fill in the blank. Verse 4, So it was on the next day that the people rose early, built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. The children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord? Give me your attention. Here their religion is full-blown. For it was David in the Psalms who wrote, Sacrifice and offerings you don't desire. It was Isaiah that wrote, These people, they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Here, they had the religion. They had the superstition. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. We have to make a burnt offering and a sacrifice offering. That's what we'll do. Now, after we've done that, who didn't come up? I got an idea. Here's my idea. Since there's 600 men from Benjamin who are dwelling, by the way, still in the mountain, afraid to come out of the mountains, they're living in the caves and the crags in the mountain, they're afraid because they're afraid they're going to get killed when they come out, I have a plan. Let's find somebody we're mad at, let's kill all them except the virgin daughters that they have, and let's give them a Benjamin and let them repopulate. That'll solve the problem. <laughs> now some of you guys are sitting here going, no, that's not what happened. Don't please tell me. I mean, I know we've been through a lot. We felt like we've been on a long journey with this book, and we know the nation has gone through, but te please tell me that doesn't happen. Oh, that's exactly what happens. Watch. Where was I? Thank you. The children of Israel said, Who is there among the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who would not come up. Now, it seems to be this weird thing. Please give me your attention one more time. It seems to be like a thing with making oaths. They take nothing for serious. But when they make an oath, oh, they're going to keep it. It's like a law of the Medes and the Persians. You know, it just can't be changed no matter what. You made an oath to God that you were going to kill your wife. So that's what you're going to do. You made an oath to God, and you can't break the oath. Now, murder, rape, sodomy, that's okay, but don't break your oath. Do you understand what's going on here? Now, again, you guys that are new to Scripture, you might be thinking, well, what is this dude talking about? Stay with me, please. Maybe get some old tapes, you'll see what's happened here. He surely shall be put to death. And the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin their brother and said, One tribe is cut off from Israel today. What shall we do for wives, for those who remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? Hey, I got an idea. Instead of doing the same thing you did that got you in this mess, why don't you just say, Hey God, I'm really sorry we made a stupid vow. We're going to help the nation of Benjamites by giving them our daughters. Are we cool with that? No, that'd be way too easy. They got to do things the hard way. And they said, what one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up to Mitzvah from the Lord? Now let me explain that to you if you knew, if you knew. So what happens is this guy, he cuts his concubine or his wife up, he sends it to the tribes of Israel, they call this big meeting and all the nations come. Half a million people show up. Who didn't show up? Because I remember when we had that big meeting, we said, if anybody doesn't show up, we're going to kill them. Oh, yeah. It was Jabeth Gilead. Did you see any? Did you see anybody from Jabeth Gilead? Did you see anybody? Okay, nobody from Jabeth Gilead come up. What should we do? 
Let's kill everybody and take their women. God will be happy with that. In fact, no one, verse, finishing verse 8, had come up to the camp from Jabeth Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were counted, indeed, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh, Jabesh Gilead was there. So the congregation sent out the 12,000 of their most valiant men and commanded them, saying, Go, strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children, and this is the thing that you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male and every woman who has known a man intimately. So they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young, young virgins who had not known a man intimately, and they brought them to the camp of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. <laughs> can it get worse? I mean, honestly, can it get worse? This is what happens. Listen, let me tell you what happens amongst Christians. Let me come down on ourselves for a minute. We have this idea if we will get rid of every pervert, every sodomite, if we'll get rid of every gay person, if we'll destroy the evil in our land, then our land will get better. Listen to me. There's a Bible verse that says in uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14, I believe it is, if my people who will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. It was G. Campbell Morgan who said this. He said, I forgot almost. He said, remind me again. G. Campbell Morgan said that it's when the church loses effectiveness is when they start to look like the world, not when they start to eradicate the world. We lose our effectiveness when we lose our desire to be holy. Now, I'm paraphrasing because I really can't remember it, so I'm kind of acting like I remember, but I really don't remember. But I remember right before I came up here. I'll remember afterwards. So if you want to know the exact word, just see me afterwards. I don't remember. But here's what he was insinuating, that the more we look like the world, the less effective we are in the world. It's not by destroying the world. It's not, yes, let's round up all the sodomites and kill them. It's not that. It's us. Now, that's the exact same place that the nation of Israel was at. Listen, they looked more like the nation. It's not like the rest of the nations were doing so good. You know, all the other tribes were doing great, but Benjamin was doing terrible. No, here was this guy from the tribe of Judah. He had a concubine. He was supposed to be a Levite, a Levite from Judah with a concubine. What are you doing? How far have you lost? And that's what's happening in our churches. That's what's happening. We've come so far away from the foundation of this word of God, we've lost our effectiveness in the world. We look just like the world. Hey, it's okay if you're living together, no problem. You smoke a little here, that don't worry about it. Come on. Do you want to change this world? Is our country, do you want to transform our country? Live the life. Fight the good fight. Faith is not believing despite the evidence. Faith is obedience despite the consequence. Do you understand that? Faith is not believing in God despite what you think is evidence against it. Faith, true faith, real faith is obedience to God despite the consequences of what will happen if you obey. Do you understand that? Yeah, it does get worse. Then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who were at the rock of Ramon and announced peace to them. So Benjamin came back at that time. Remember I told you they went up into the rocks? Well, all of a sudden they sent you know, a white flag or something. Hey, it's cool. We're cool now. We're cool now. As a matter of fact, not only are we cool, but guess what? Here's some women that you can have. Um, they, they're women that they've kept alive from Jabesh Gilead. And yet they had not found enough for them. Oh, we only found 400 women. We wiped out all Jabesh Gilead and there was only 400 virgins in the whole place. So we brought them back. So we're lacking 200. What should we do? What should we do? What should we do? Now we made a vow to God. We can't give them our daughters. But you know what? I got an idea. You know how we have this big feast and all the virgins, they go dance in the forest? Well, let the Benjamites come and kidnap them. 
it's not like we gave them. It's kind of like a way around the vow. So, so here's... They obviously didn't know the verse that says, Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. What a man sows this to, he shall reap. They obviously had not figured this out yet, that God's a little smarter than them. Because in having a, ready, relationship with God, the Spirit of God can move upon the Word of God and change your heart. Here, they really thought they were going to outsmart God. Man, I don't want to break my vow. You know, something bad might happen. My crops might die or something like that. But if they go dancing in the field and they get kidnapped, Oh, well, please tell me that that didn't happen. Can't do that. That's what happened. Then the elders of the congregation said, <laughs> look at verse 15, and the people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a void in the tribes of it. Yeah, the Lord did it. Then the elders of the congregation said, What shall we do for wise for those who remain since the women of Benjamin have been destroyed? And they said, there must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. However, we cannot give them our wives for our for, as wives from our daughters for the children of Israel have sworn an oath, saying, Cursed be the one who gives a wife to Benjamin. Then they said, In fact, wait, there's a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south to Labona. Therefore, they instructed the children of Benjamin, saying, Go, lie in wait in the vineyards and watch. And just when the daughters of Shiloh come out to perform their dances, then come out of the vineyards, and every man catch a wife for himself from the daughters of Shiloh. Then go to the land of Benjamin. Then it shall be when their fathers or brothers come to us to complain, we'll say, Hey, go easy on them for our sakes, because uh, we didn't take a wife for any of them from the war. It's not like as though you have given the women to them at this time, making yourselves guilty of your oath. <laughs> hey, Benjamites, go in the forest. When the women come into the field and start dancing the dance of virgins, go and kidnap them. Listen, when their fathers and brothers come to us and look for justice, we're going to say, go easy on them. It's our fault anyway because we killed all their wives and daughters. You know what I'm saying? And it's not like you broke your oath. You really didn't know it was going to happen. Did this happen? Hey, guys, let me remind you. We're not reading like some fairy tale book. The nation has gone that deep into, what's the word? Degradation? Degradation? That's how bad it is. Now, it's not like something crazy like passing a law that allows people to get stinking stoned and drive their car or anything like that. It's not like making a law that says that you can have sex with underage girls. It's nothing that... Yeah. We've lost our effectiveness. Our country has so swiveled, vacillated back and forth. Are you ready? Are you ready to be a minority? Because you're a minority. And I'm not just talking about the brothers around here. I'm talking about the Christians. You're a minority now. And are you willing, ready? Are you willing to say, then a minority I shall be, for I will never agree with the Republicans. I will never agree with the Democrats. I will be a minority who believes in Christ and believes the only safe place is in Christ's arms. And I'll vote for the wrong guy every single time because I will not choose the lesser of two evils for my country, but I will be holy and I will choose righteousness. Woe unto him who calls evil good and good evil. Isaiah well wrote, mercy has fallen in the streets and justice can't get through. Are you ready for that? Or let's, I got a better idea. Let's, I heard the whole tea party thing is a good movement. Let's join with them. Yeah, but some of them are doing some, ah, as long as we get a good man in the office. I mean, he's not a Christian, but maybe he's like a Mormon. Not me. Not me. I'm ready. Because He's coming soon. His return is imminent in a minute. 
It's so near. It's at the door. And I'm waiting. And I don't want to be found compromising when he comes back. You guys have heard me say it before. When the rapture happens, what are you going to be doing? What are you going to be doing? Hey, I'm voting for raptured. Hey, who are you just voting for? Nobody? Hey, what were you just watching on TV? Nothing? Nothing. Do I get my new body now? <sighs> hey, listen, you know, be kind to them for our sakes. Because um, we did not take a wife for any of them in the war. For it is not as though you had given the women to them at this time, making yourselves guilty of your oath. You're, you're, you're free. You're clean. And the children of Benjamin did so. And they took enough wives for their number from those who danced, whom they caught. Then they went and returned to their inheritance, and they rebuilt their cities and dwelt in them. So the children of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family. They went out from there, every man to his inheritance. And in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now that's the last line and the first line of the book that we've just finished. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There's a word for it. I'm trying to remember. It's called um, relative... I forgot that one, too. I must have lost that one when I was 15. Relative valueism. That's the word. Relative valueism. Where people do what's right for what they think. There's no value in moral absolutes. Man, my words ain't coming tonight. Moral relativism. Whatever values you happen to possess at that point in time, whatever values that society has, here's what they're going to tell you guys. And, and listen, let me be bold. Let me be bold. Listen, we've just come out of a really bad time to be white. For the last 50 years in our country, it's been bad to be white. Bad. Because no matter what you did, if you were black, it was okay. The society that has been replaced is the society that has been given to political correctness. Now, depending on the neighborhood you come in, or the neighborhood you were brought up in, Listen to what I tell you now. Here's the new way. Ready? It's going to be a bad time to be black. Because the sickest thing has happened. They have traded one color for the other color, and their value relativism is there. Now, all you're seeing on the news is a black man did this to a white man. A black man did this to this man. A black man. And you're thinking, wait a second. Why are they trading one for the other? When you couldn't, in, in just a few years ago, you couldn't say a black man did anything to anybody because it wouldn't be reported on NBC, it wouldn't be reported on saying You can't say anything bad about anybody of color. Now, all of a sudden, on TV, on the news, all you're seeing is the opposite. And this is what they want to do. They want to divide us. They want to conquer us. Listen to me. It was a man about 50 years ago, he said, I have a dream that a man will be judged by the content of his character rather than the color of his skin. And there was a man who said, and this is what he said, he said, I fear for my black race, for the charlatans are abounding more and more of our own color, telling our people what they have coming to them instead of going out and earn it. That was George Washington Carver who said that in the early 1900s. Now is the time to follow what this book says more and more and more. And to look around you and judge each other by the spirit that is within you, not the color that's upon you, the, the, the money you have, or anything like that. If this society goes the way it looks like it's going, let me tell you something. The race war is coming. And it's going to fall hardest in cities like we are. Listen, let me let you people in on a little secret. And, and, and if I'm offending somebody, come and talk to me afterwards so I can make it clear. 
Black people make up less than 15% of this country. If the newspapers and the televisions have its way, when the war starts, the coasts are going to be destroyed, white and black, gather together as brothers, as we do at this church every week. What do I love about this church? I tell you, every week, the variation of people that come here, Italians and Irish, wow, hanging out together. Didn't happen in my neighborhood. I say in jest, and the white and the black. The brothers and the sisters who don't care about the color of each other's skin, but they look at each other's spirit and they discern, you know, I really don't care what color you are, buddy. You're no good. Or, bro, I don't care what color you are. Let's go out. Let's hang out. Let's encourage each other and have what the Bible calls true fellowship. (coughs) Do you know every time that you hang out with somebody and you talk about the Lord, in the book of Malachi, in the third chapter, it says that, the, that they write a book about it. There's a book about fellowship. Now, there's no book about football, NFL. I know that just started. Everybody's into the fantasy league. There's no book. You get to heaven and be like, oh, you're the dude that won the fantasy football league. Come on. Angel Gabriel wants to meet you. <laughs> no, no. But there is a book about fellowship. In the third chapter of Malachi, And when they talked about the Lord, a book was written. Ah, my people are talking about me. Isn't that great? That's not to say football's bad, no fantasy football. My son loves it, the youth groups, have fun. But don't may it absorb you so much that you forget. God gave you football to enjoy, not to obsess. Right? Now again, if something I said tonight in any way, shape, or form offended you, let me clarify it, make sure, because I often mess up my words, I'm often, but I'm trying to illustrate the power of unity. You see what it said? There is no king in Israel, and everybody did what was right in his own eyes. And let me tell you, lastly, and here's where we close, the last thing. There's no king in Israel. There's still no king in Israel. But there will be one soon. And his name is Jesus Christ. He's coming back. He's coming back soon. One person makes such a giant difference. Do you understand? There's no leader in Israel at the time. Nobody stood up and said, that's wrong. Let's not do that. There's no king. There's nobody standing up with the Spirit of the living God saying, come on, let's do. One person makes such a difference in a home, in a job, in a workplace. Listen, when we do the convalescent homes and one person brings a Bible study, it transforms the whole place. Within a matter of months, you see the spirit of the living God moving on the hearts of people. And then you pull that person out and that place sinks. Let me tell you, and I don't mean to brag about the dude because I love what he does. My brother Frankie, when you go down and you see the power of the Word of God going forth at the courthouse and the things that, I'm telling you, he transforms that place. And him, and there's a few other people that do that. There's one woman that goes there and she plays that gospel music. What's that woman's name? You know know, know that woman who plays the piano? One time we invited her down to church. She wouldn't come. That was great. They make a difference. And you remove that person The same way the toilet bowl spins when you flush it. One person makes a difference. There was no king and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Mm. (laughs) That's where we're at, guys. Be a king where you're at until the king comes, until the true king comes. Make a difference. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've given us a chance to read your word to speak your truth. God, we thank you that you've given us a spirit to discern the times as your word says that you've given us, um, you rebuked, God, your word says you rebuked the, the Pharisees because he said that you can look at the sky and say it's red and it's a, a storm coming, but you cannot discern the sign of the times. God, may we dwell in unity and peace. May the world be astonished at the diversity of the body of Christ in this church and in this country. And God, may they wonder what's going on there. 
as we lift up the Son of Man, for your word says that when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. And God, may this word which you brought forth continue to transform us and change us. May it continue to have us think for ourselves and act by the power of your Spirit. May the confirming power of your word lead and guide us. Holy Spirit, Right now, seal in our hearts and minds the word that went forth. If there's anybody here, God, that your word spoke to, and yet the enemy is trying to snatch the seed, seal them, God. Seal them. Great and awesome God, Holy Spirit, we call upon you. Seal us and change us. Transform us and mold us. May by the power of your word and the power of your spirit, we may have right thinking. For your word says you've given us no fear, but power and love and a sound mind. May these things happen 